great to see so many here at church today, seeing kids here with their mums. Maybe that's all they asked for today, that you would be here. And how wonderful. Why don't you take your seats? I want to honour my own mum, uh, Pastor Lois. She's not just my mum. She's been the spiritual mum of this house for 25 years. So why don't we honour her today? For her wisdom, the grace that she shows, the passion for God, the gift of her marriage that she gives to this place. And she's going to continue to be a mother in this house, so she's not going anywhere. But I, why don't we honour her today, even after the service? Why, no, no, you don't have to clap again. But why don't we just make sure that we show honour to her as well? Because we have both natural mothers, but we also have our spiritual mothers. And so maybe here today, your mum was amazing. Maybe your mum lacked in some areas, but God has brought spiritual mothers to your life. Why don't we also honour them today? Uh, send them a message, give them a hug and thank them for what they've poured into your life. It's wonderful. It's wonderful to be in the house where we get to experience that. You know, in Accelerate, one of the things we've been talking about, how when we give our life to Christ, we get adopted into a family. And we don't just have our natural family, but we have our spiritual family. And that is what we want to pattern after, our spiritual family. Together we try and become more like Christ. So we are so blessed. Blessed for our mothers, blessed for our spiritual mothers. So today, look, my message is not just for mums. Um, although a lot of the things that I'm going to be talking about are things that I learnt on my journey as a mum and empower me as a mum. So I hope that it blesses uh, you today, mums, and also to all of us. This is something that is uh, spiritual truth. So why don't we pray before we get started? Thank you, Jesus, Lord, for your voice that you are still speaking we thank you for your voice that is in the Word of God. We thank you for your Holy Spirit, Lord, that speaks alongside your Word. And God, I pray today that as we hear that we're, our spiritual ears are attuned to you, God. Lord, we put aside distractions, the food that we're going to eat later, maybe the last minute cards we need to write. And Lord, we just say, Lord, we're going to focus on you these next few moments to hear from you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Now, when I go shopping, um, it is a well-planned out venture. Uh, I am someone uh, who does something called meal planning. Do I have any other fellow meal planners out there? Not many. So let me explain what happens. <laughs> I have an Excel spreadsheet and I, uh, <laughs> and I have a fortnightly plan of what we're going to eat for that fortnight, dinners. Then I do, <laughs> then I do, people are like, whoa. Uh, then I do an exact shopping list based on that plan. Then I categorize it based on like fridge food, vegetables, thingy. And then I do it, put it in the order of that shop, the, the store that I'm going to go to. So my plan is to go in and out very quickly. Does anyone else do that? My mum does that, that's right. Gina does that, a few of you. <laughs> but a couple of weeks ago, I made a mistake. I, I, did, I did something, I broke the rule of grocery shopping. Okay, the, the rule of grocery shopping is when you break this rule, you spend too much money and you end up forgetting things on your list. What do you think I did? I didn't take my list, no. I didn't take my kids. Sometimes I have to take them, but that's also a disaster. Maybe that's why I'm so well planned. Uh, no, I went shopping hungry. Yeah? So this particular day, I had a really light lunch. And, and actually, we had just got home from holidays. So our fridge was empty. Our pantry was empty. And so this list was long. And so I'm going shopping and it's going on and on and on. And I'm getting hungrier and hungrier and hungrier. I'm the kind of person that when I'm hungry, like, I feel like fainting. I don't, I don't do hungry well. You know that, that ad uh, when, you're, when you're, you're not you when you're hungry? That's like me. I'm not me when I'm hungry. And so this shop's going on and on. My hunger's growing and growing. But so too was my awareness. My awareness of everything that I could eat. And I saw everything. I'm like seeing food I've never seen before. I'm noticing things and wanting things that I've never wanted before. Like packet noodles looked good to me. 
canned like tin spaghetti and baked beans. I'm like, oh, this would be so good right now. And just things were coming out like baking chocolate. Oh my goodness, give me baking chocolate. So everything that I looked at, I wanted. Things that I didn't notice before, I noticed. My hunger created like a completely different shopping experience. It changed my tastes. It changed my focus. It, It changed my desires. It was completely different. If, if when I'm not hungry, as I said, all I see is what's on my list. I'm in, I'm out, I'm looking for discounts, praise God. <laughs> and hopefully it's not too much money when I get to, the, get to the checkout. But this time, it was like I was in a completely different realm. I'm like seeing things, whoa. <laughs> like, and I had to like tell myself, focus, just look, just focus on the list, focus on the list. But I was seeing so much else. You see, hunger changes our experience. Hunger allows us or gives us an awareness to see the unseen. Now, we are starting a new series today called Heaven is Here. And can I propose that there is a realm, there is a reality that exists amongst us that often we are not aware of because we are not hungry. Luke 17 verse 21 says that the kingdom of heaven is right here. It is right here amongst us. It's in our midst right now. God's power is in our midst. The power of God, the power of the gospel is here. The power of God to heal, the power of God to move, to speak, that we can encounter is right here at our disposal. And yet, for many of us, most of the time, we are oblivious to the reality of God's presence and power that he, that, want, that he wants to be seen right here, right now. It is hunger that opens our eyes to the reality of God's presence. Without hunger, we do not experience power. Without hunger, we do not experience power. So are you hungry this morning? Do you expect to see power, God move in your life? Matthew 6 verse 10, and this has been our key scripture this year. It says that this should be our prayer, that that your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as we see it in heaven, as it is in heaven, may we experience As believers in Jesus, we have a decision. We can decide, am I going to settle for a human, natural life? Or am I going to pull down and draw out the reality of heaven so that it can be seen now in my life? It's a decision. Mark 16 verse 15, it says, Go into the world and preach the gospel, and these signs will accompany those who believe. Signs will accompany those who believe. It says, in my name, they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will place their hands on sick people and they will get well. Signs of power should follow those who believe. We do not have a powerless faith. Signs of power should follow us. Ephesians 3 verse 20 says, through his mighty power that works within us, We can accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. How many of us want to tap into that infinitely more part? How many of us are a bit tired and disillusioned by a faith that seems powerless? We are called to demonstrate the power of God. Luke 24 says that we are to be clothed in power. Before we go about mission, we are to be clothed in power. We are called to live a divine life. This is what this series is about, about living a a divine life where we expect that God will speak, that God will move, that God will heal, that he's going to do something. It's not just going to be all natural and and ordinary, but there's going to be a supernatural to our lives. And yet we can find that our hunger for a powerful life has been suppressed. How many of you drink coffee here? How many coffee drinkers do we have? Many. Do you know that coffee is an appetite suppressant? My, my husband, um, and I, I didn't even ask to share this, I, I apologise. 
But my husband, um, <laughs> in his corporate days, uh, before, he, before we started working together when I would make his meals for him, um, <laughs> he would live off six, like six coffees a day. Would that be correct? Six? About six. He wouldn't eat all day. And he would come home for dinner and that would be his first meal of the day. Very unhealthy. And his body would tell him that because he would get run down all the time. He would get sick all the time. You see, our appetite, our hunger is a signal of health. Anything that suppresses that is not healthy. And so, you know, when you go to the doctors, they ask you about your appetite, you know, especially when you've been really sick, what's your appetite like? They, they want to know because anything that suppresses it says that something seriously is wrong. It is the same for us spiritually when our appetite for God, for the things of the Spirit is not there. When we don't hunger, when we become complacent, it tells us that we are sick. I know that's hard to hear, but it tells us that there is something sick Something is wrong because it shouldn't be like that. And so today I want to, that's why I want to talk about this hunger, this hunger that we are called to have. Hunger allows us not only to see, but allows us to access and pull down the power of God in our life. We need to get our hunger back, church. Our hunger to see God move. Don't just come to church and go, oh, that was a nice service. No, I, God, I want to see you move today. I want to see you touch my life. I want to hear you speak to me today. I don't want to leave the same person as I was. That we have an expectancy that our faith is powerful, not powerless. It's not just a nice little activity that we do. So I want to talk about that today, activating our hunger for power. How do we cultivate, how do we awaken hunger for God? I'm going to share two things today. I realize that if I share three points, it goes way too long. So let's just do two. So point number one is we need to activate Christ's power within us. We need to activate Christ, not, not our inner power, not some power, new agey thing that there's something in there from someone else or whatever, but Christ's power. Galatians 2 verse 20, it says, my old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. This verse has changed my life. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Romans 8 verse 11 says, the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. The Holy Spirit, the power of God lives in you. It isn't something we get from above. It comes from within because Christ lives in us. It was not just for a moment of salvation. The Holy Spirit resides in us as a means of grace that we would live every day and enabled by divine power. 2 Peter 1 verse 3, it says, another verse that's changed my life, his, his divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. Yes, yes. His divine power has given us everything we need. Through this, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that you may participate in and be partakers of the divine nature that you may participate in. You are partakers, that you share in the divine nature and power of God. You have a divine nature. Oh, some of you can't understand that. You have a divine nature because Christ lives in you. That is the power of the gospel. What is the power of the gospel? The power of the gospel is that the power of God lives in you to transform you, to free you, to speak to you, to move through you to others. And so, there should be a joy. There should be an ease to the Christian life because we aren't doing it all. He does it through us. So you can only access this power though when we stop trying to live for God ourselves by all our own efforts and we learn how to let him do it through us. Now I know it sounds easier than it is. Because for many of us, we've been in church a very long time and we haven't learned to access the power of God to let him live the Christian life through us. You see, many of us try very hard to be good. We try very hard to follow the rules and meet the expectations. 
And instead of listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit, we, we like to follow what's tangible. We like to follow and listen to people. We like to listen to what the church says or what the pastor says or, or what my auntie said or what my parents told me to do or, or what I read here or did there. And, and instead of following what the Spirit is saying to us, we prefer things that seem more tangible. And many of us have not learnt how to live by the Spirit, how to live by the promptings, obviously through the Word, but, but then through the Word and then by the Spirit. And so we try to keep up with these ought to's and that's what our Christian life looks like. I ought to go, it's tick boxes. I ought to go to church. I ought to read my Bible. I ought to pray and I ought to love others, you know. Um, and, and there's no life and power in it. We're just trying really hard to be good. But there's no life and power in that. But instead, if we were to learn to let the Spirit do it within us, we don't do anything because we ought to. We do it. We start to learn how to do it because we want to. And that's what the Spirit does within us. He transforms our desires and He makes us want to to hunger after Him. He makes us to want to encounter Him, to, to abide in Him, to know Him. And it doesn't become a chore anymore. It doesn't become a hard task. It doesn't become a tick box. It becomes a joy and ease. The divine nature within us transforms us and it takes us from a striving and it takes us to rest, to rest, that easy yoke that Jesus talks about in Matthew 28. Around three years ago, I was reading a book about these truths. And it so transformed my life that we then, we did it in Accelerate as well. Everything I always put into Accelerate, if it, if it changes my life, there you go, Accelerate. <laughs> they get the fruit of it. But I knew that, that I needed to grow in this whole area. I read this book and I'm like, whoa, I've got a long way to go here. I'm learning how to access this power from within. So not, not long, I reckon about two months after I'd started this journey with, with Christ, I get this phone call from a friend who was going to tell me something very, very disappointing, something that, was, that, was, that she had done that was really not good, okay? And before this, I know that I would have really struggled to have responded with love. I think I would have judged her, and I think I would have tried to teach her something, okay? That's just the way I am, the way I was. And, uh, and, and I think that's what I would have done. So anyway, I get this phone call from her. And she doesn't, you know, like some people lead into, you know, I've just got to tell you something and it's going to be hard for you. It's really hard for me to, no, no. She just went, blah, blah, blah. I had no warning it was coming. It came out of nowhere. I was completely off guard. And in an instant, I remember having this, this thing of going, I don't have it within me to respond how she needs me to respond right now. It was just this instant thought. It wasn't even a prayer. It was just in the natural, I can't give what she needs me to give her to respond like Christ. She actually wasn't a Christian. And I'm like, I'm going to not respond well here. I was, so, I was like, whoa. But honestly, in that moment, what came out of my mouth was not me. What ended up coming out of my mouth was not me. I say that I was shocked what I said. She was shocked what I said. What came out of me was a supernatural ability. And I say that because it wasn't learned. I had no practice leading up until this time. It was an imparted supernatural ability to love her and accept her and to pour grace upon her. And I was, it was the first time I'd, I'd actually experienced this just instant impartation of God's power to love. And I was like, whoa. And as I said, she was shocked. I was shocked. And, and I say that because I'd never responded to such bad news before in that way, ever. And I was like, whoa. And, and this was the first of many experiences. And, and, you know, my friend, she was healed from shame that day. And it brought healing to my relationship with her. And I believe that she took a step, a step closer to the kingdom of God because of that. And I learned from that and many other examples that have followed since then, that when I stop trying to draw on my own capacity, when I stop trying to draw on my own abilities, when I realize that Christ is within me, when I have an awareness, Christ is with me right now and he wants to express himself 
in this situation. They don't need more Alyssa. They need Christ now. And when I have an awareness of that, I see that God changes my heart, that God gives me the power that's needed for that moment because it's his moment. It's not my moment. When our awareness of Christ grows, we are able to walk, our walk with Jesus becomes unforced. Our hunger for him grows. And the supernatural becomes this way of life because wherever we go, Jesus can express himself. Wherever we go, Jesus is there and he is, he, we are attuned to his voice and he can, can minister and do what he needs to do through us. Now, as a mum with young kids, I don't spend my week up here, you know. Uh, my life, I'm often, you know, trapped in a loop of the mundane tasks of changing nappies and preparing snacks and preparing snacks and preparing snacks <laughs> and cleaning up messes and negotiating with my three-year-old to brush her hair once again. You know, that's my life, you know, and I have realised and had to adjust over the last three years that, that, that the power of God is and the manifest presence of God is not just for ministry. It is not just for platform. It is for my kids. It is just for me. It is for, for the, our husbands and our, our wives. It is for our work colleagues. It's for our school friends. It's for uh, strangers who don't expect anything from us. And yet every now and then, Christ will ask us to give them a supernatural flow of his love and generosity. And so it's not just for ministry. It is for ministry, but it's not just for ministry. With his power, we don't have to rely on just our capacity, what we're good at. We can access the Spirit's power. We don't just speak our words. We learn to speak the heart of God for people. Are your ears in tune with the Spirit? Or is this something that you need to learn, to, to listen to His voice, His leadings? And it takes time to learn the voice and be sent this, have the sensitivity towards the Spirit. But who wants a life that flows from power? How many of you want a life that flows from the Spirit? Today is an invitation to stop looking to people, to plans, even to the church at times, and actually listen to the voice of God. Religion will suppress the voice of God but the Spirit will elevate it. He will elevate that hunger for the things of God. So number, number one is that it's the accessing the Christ power within us. And number two, I want to talk a bit about how do we increase that awareness of Christ being with us? How do we find those moments that we can access God's power? How do we unlock that? And number two, it's through this, surrender. Surrender through weakness. Matthew 5 verse 3 it says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Bless, blessed are those who are like spiritual, spiritual beggars. They are destitute. They are needy. Here Jesus is telling us that we have to learn how to be in a perpetual state of ongoing need. Not just, I got there one time three years ago, but living in an ongoing state of need despite our circumstances, despite how blessed we are, despite our wealth, despite our, our circumstances, that we would stay, learn how to stay poor in spirit. A few weeks ago, I was talking to, to uh, someone that, that I know, and he, um, he's quite a successful man, and, and he goes to church sometimes, um, and he is wealthy, he, he lives in a nice area, he has a good job, and um, he just asked me, we were at, sort of at a dinner, and he asked me, uh, so tell me, what is, what is the, uh, the focus of the church, the global church, do you think, after COVID? And I said to him, look, I think that the thing that, that we're seeing is that there is a, a greater focus, wanting that we're, we're trying to create a greater focus on the depth of discipleship and, and, and a greater commitment to community. And his response to that was, oh, yeah. He goes, well, he's like, you know, Alyssa, I have a job. I have a, a house, a career. I'm busy. 
you know, the church should really look to do those things with people who need Jesus. You know, people who have time. And uh, he goes, you know, you've got to go out into the community and find people who have real needs and, uh, and you can build it with them. And, you know, maybe we hear that and say, oh, that's, well, that's really funny. But I think actually that this mindset represents a widespread uh, mindset that actually suppresses our appetite for God. And it sounds like this. We don't maybe say it out loud like he did. God bless him. Um, but it sounds like this. Relative to others, I'm not that messed up. Relative to others, I don't need God as much. And I don't know if it's we, we, we take pride in the fact that oh, I'm not being a burden on God. Or I just don't need God as much. But the Bible very clearly tells us that if we deny if we minimize, if we cover our weakness, then we miss out on the power of God. So 2 Corinthians, I want to show you two verses. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 7, it says, We now have this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. This makes it clear that our great power is from God and not ourselves. No matter how strong we are or appear, no matter how together we look, how talented we are, how long we have been in church, how loved we are, we are all just like clay jars that are fragile. We are breakable. We are disposable. We are dispensable. We are cracked. And maybe you grew up in a a culture where showing weakness, admitting weakness, was a sign of, uh, was, was a shameful thing to do. I think many cultures can, can be like this. But what we have to learn as we come into the family of God, when we leave our family of origin and we come into the family of God, is that the kingdom of God is only accessible to those who are weak. It is only accessible to those who will admit and humble themselves to say, I need God and live from that state of perpetual, ongoing need. 2 Corinthians 12 verse 7 to 10, famous scripture of Paul. It says, therefore, in in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. And that is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul rejoices here in his weakness because he knows that it is that that makes him a conduit, a vessel for God's power. It isn't his strength. It isn't his talent. It isn't how much he knows the scripture. It is his weakness that makes him a conduit for God's power. And so he's saying in these two, these two Corinthians, verses, Corinthians verses, Paul is categorically and graphically telling us that weakness is essential and necessary for the display of God's glory and power. Essential and necessary. Now, what Paul is not saying, and we can confuse this, if we've been Christians for a long time, we get a little bit confused about whose power it is. We can think that his power makes us more powerful. His strength makes us stronger. But it doesn't. When we, you see, it's not our strength, it's not our power. When we embrace our weakness before God in surrender, he puts his power into us and manifests it through us, but it was never ours. And so we must stay weak. We must stay, stay weak to stay a vessel. We don't become stronger. We have to stay 
poor in spirit. We need to learn how to go low and stay low. We don't become more powerful. He becomes stronger. So we have to learn how to embrace our weakness now as a lifestyle. Okay, it is not just a one-time thing or once a year I'll surrender my life to Jesus. No, (laughs) as a lifestyle. As you can see from the way that I do my grocery shopping, I have control issues. And uh, (laughs) maybe more than most. Uh, And I didn't always call it that, actually, when I was um, probably about until about three years ago. I thought that... um, you know, it was just part of my life. And and I actually lived the majority of my life with a lot of fear and anxiety. And I thought that it was because I was just doing the hard work of the ministry. And then I had a baby, a very difficult baby. And I realised, and what I saw is that my inability to handle anything out of my control was actually the problem. It wasn't ministry, it wasn't any people that had hurt me or nothing. It was, it was my inability to handle anything out of my control. And so when I came to this point where I was just in absolute mess, was an absolute mess of a person at that point and not coping with life at all because God chose to give me a baby and th- I thank God for that. God gave me a baby that I could not handle <laughs> but in that I realised how weak I was. And when I finally acknowledged the source of my symptoms, which was this inability to handle control, the journey began. Not the journey of conquering that weakness, but the journey of learning how to access God's power for that weakness. Do you understand? I, I didn't begin the journey of conquering that weakness, but it began the journey of learning how to access God's power for that weakness. I don't believe in my time alive that I will ever be totally free of my control issues. I don't think that takes a lack of faith to to say that, if you know me. (laughs) But like Paul, I have come to rejoice in my weakness because it often, and when I say often, I would say at least twice daily, it leads me to awareness that I need Jesus. And, to, and, and allows me to experience a powerful life. You see, now, whenever fear and anxiety come back, and it could just be for a few minutes, sometimes I might, it might be a day, but whenever fear and anxiety return, to me it heightens my need that I need to get into the presence of God. And I need to surrender that before Him. And so I have learned to, over the three years, I've learned to more quickly you know, I was actually supposed to see a psychologist, but because of COVID, it all got shut down. So I was left dealing with the tatters of my life, uh, just me and God, you know, during that time. Um, but in that time, I learned how to surrender all the things that were out of my control. And it sounded like this, God, I give up the right to know what's going to happen. I give up the right to be able to make sense of it. I give up the right and the temptation to try and manipulate people and and situations so that I feel more safe and secure. And I do this all the time. Whenever I sense fear in my spirit, that anxiety come into my heart, it immediately heightens my need for God and I am grateful for that. And so I get to experience God's peace and power in my life and I don't live with anxiety or fear anymore. I really don't. It visits but it doesn't stay. But what I want you to understand is that we, I am still weak, but he is strong. We can live with weakness and still experience the strength of God. Have you learned to embrace your weakness as a lifestyle? Or have you got stuck in the cycle of trying to escape it, pray it away? Or maybe you pride yourself on, I don't really need God that much. You know, I used to be very defensive, and sometimes I still am a bit defensive about my weaknesses and my failures. And, and I, I'm actually, though, getting to a place that when I get that feedback from people or when I, I see to myself, I'm actually starting to get to a point where I'm excited. I'm like, God, show me more weakness. Because if there's more weakness, there's more power. And if there's more weakness, there are deeper levels of freedom available to me. And so if we could reframe our weakness, you see... In the natural realm, nobody wants problems. 
Nobody wants pain. But as we mature spiritually, we start to see that it's not that problems attract power. It's that problems create an opportunity for surrender and surrender attracts the power of God. And so when humility, humility is what comes into the life of a person who's facing unanswered prayers, when they're facing loss and pain and, and disappointment with God. And in those moments, we, we have to choose, am I, am I going to let my pain distort my view of God? Am I going to redefine God because of my pain? Or in the mystery that I'm in, in the pain that am I in, am I going to step into this moment and say, God, show me greater levels of your power. Show me greater manifestations of your power. It's like God says... If you will trust me with great loss, I will trust you with great gain. And in those moments of life that backfire, it's like we find the back door to the throne room. And God will say, I will show you increase. I will show you breakthrough. I will show you my presence and my power in a way that you have never experienced it. You know, you may not get the answer to your prayer that you were wanting, but you will experience the power of God. And I feel there are people here today and maybe you face, you face your pain right now even and maybe shake your fist up at God and you wonder where God is. You wonder why God hasn't answered your prayer. But I pray that today that you can turn from that, surrender the right to know, surrender the right to get what you want and decide to exalt him anyway. Decide to lift up his name anyway. It's that stripping away of self-sufficiency. It's that part of us that goes, "I, I cannot do it. It's that surrender and that humility that opens our heart to be fed and filled by the Holy Spirit. So when was the last time that you surrendered to God? I'm not talking about in a big moment. I mean in those everyday moments. I encourage you that as God's eyes roam the earth, that he is not looking for somebody that is strong today. He is looking for someone who is willing to be weak. And I pray that his eyes would rest on you today, that he would find someone willing to be poor in spirit. If I can invite the worship team to come up. You know, if the power of the gospel is not transforming our lives and the lives of those around us, it's not a shortage of power on God's end. It's not a shortage of power on God's end. And so we have an opportunity today and and this week to, to ask the Holy Spirit, if I'm not seeing that in my life, then God, what adjustments do you want me to make? What are you calling me to do so that your power would be would be real in my life? So that I can experience a faith that is powerful and not powerless, a divine life, not a human life. Our assignment is not to blend in. Our assignment is not to be powerless. Our assignment is to to demonstrate the power of God, the reality of Jesus to a world that wants to know and needs to know that there is something more. There is something more. And so when we live surrendered, when we live humble, open, weak, relying on the Spirit of God, attuning to Him in those moments of weakness to let His power flow through us. That is when heaven is open. We are ready to receive from the King at any moment and an outpouring of heaven can flow through your life. So let's learn to embrace loss and weakness as a lifestyle, as a lifestyle, because it's in that place of ongoing surrender, that place of emptiness where we truly know I have nothing to offer him. I have nothing. 
You have nothing to offer God of any worth except an empty vessel. That's all we can give Him. And in that emptiness, that weakness, that is when He can take over and trust us with great manifestations of His power. We are weak, but He is strong and He will get all the glory. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Would you close your eyes this morning? Before Christ's power can flow through us, and God wants that for each of you today, but before His power can flow through you, we first have an opportunity to invite Him to live in us. The power of God first needs a vessel. And today there is an opportunity that you would ask Jesus to come and live inside you. You see, without Jesus, we are lost. Without Jesus, heaven is out of reach for us. Without him, we are hopeless to fix ourselves. And maybe you have felt that fear. You have felt that powerlessness to save yourself. It's only when we are ready to admit that we need Jesus, that we are sinners, that we need him to save our souls, that we are ready for an exchange. You see, 2,000 years ago, Jesus died on a cross. He humbled himself to die a criminal's death, not because he was a criminal, not because he was bad, not because he deserved punishment, but because we did. We deserved it. Because no matter how much we try to live good, we don't do good. And so we deserved punishment. And yet Jesus, he did the exchange. Out of his love for us, he gave up his life. He died in your place so that you would be able to reach him, so that you would become unpunishable because he has already paid the price of your sin. Jesus made you right with God. He did for you what you could not do for him. So today, if you sense that God is knocking on your heart, if you sense that God is saying, it's time to walk towards me. God is not out of reach today. Because of Jesus, heaven is not out of reach today. His grace is not out of reach. His forgiveness is not out of reach. His power is not out of reach today because of what Jesus has done for you. But today, would you respond? Would you respond to Jesus? I'm going to ask you to raise your hand if you want to say yes to Jesus. And raising your hand is really just an outward sign. Yep, I see that hand. If there's anyone today that says, I want to, I'm raising my hand as an outward sign of inwardly what I'm saying. I'm saying, yes, I see that hand. Thank you. Anyone else today? Yep, I see that hand. Just say, I want to receive Jesus today. I want to, we're going to say a prayer all together right now. And if this is a prayer that you know you need to say, I encourage you, say it with all your heart and you will be saved. Let's repeat, all of us repeat it today. Jesus, today I come before you a sinner. I cannot save myself. I call upon your name to save me to forgive my sins. Thank you for making me a new creation. I invite you to live in me, to divinely empower me. Today, I accept your grace. I accept your hand outstretched towards me. Jesus, you chose me. Today and forever, I choose you. Amen. Why don't we put our hands together for those that responded in faith today.